What's up, Theology Nerds? This is Trip, and on the Theology Nerd Throwdown today, you get the last taste, the little ideological morsel from the End of Religion Conference. We partnered with Villanova University to, to get out on the interwebs right into your earbuds. And today, you hear from the one and only Jack Caputo. And before we jump into this podcast and hear him talk about the end of religion, hear him give feedback to Aaron Simmons, Merrill Westfall, Jeffrey Robbins. And, and, and before we get to that, I just want to tell you that Jack Caputo and I want you to come hang out with us November 4th in Springfield, Missouri. That's right, the day before Subverting the Norm 3 begins, we're having a Theology Nerd Boot Camp. What's that, you may be saying? A Theology Nerd Boot Camp? That is a day-long, nerd alicious fiesta of intellectual stimulation and philosophical wonderings. Jack and I are going to be talking about what philosophers talk about when they talk about God. When philosophers speak about God, what does a philosopher mean? Well, we're going to look at three different philosophers as examples of three different types of God talk. We're going to talk about Aquinas, great chain of being. That would be one one transcendent other big notion of God. We're going to do Hegel and his imminent notion of God and history. And then we're going to do Derrida, which is the, you know, Jack's favorite. I probably, I probably go with Hegel. That's just kind of how process people roll. Anyway, we're going to talk about those three philosophers then what they mean by God and how it impacts religion, uh, practice of religion, community, theology, and that kind of stuff. And it's going to go all day from like noon until the evening. Then we're going to go have dinner and drinks, and you can take a selfie with Jack Caputo. There you go. So head on over to homebrewedchristianity.com and uh, get your ticket for the Theology Nerd Boot Camp. Um, if you're coming to subvert the norm, there's no reason not to come in a little bit early. If you're not coming to subvert the norm, but live nearby or want to just have a day with Jack and I, then you can get a ticket as well. If you are going to subvert the norm, November 5th to 7th at Drury University in Springfield, Missouri, then you should use the homebrewed code. We have a discount code, STN, no, HBCSTN. Homebrewed Christianity, Subvert the Norm. Initials there, HBC, STN. You put those junks in, and then, boom, you get the chick cheapest ticket possible. The cheapest ticket. That's all you have to do. Then, beyond that, if you use the code, then I'm going to buy you a pint when we all hang out with all the deacons and such at Mother's Brewing Company in Springfield, Missouri. While we're there. So, just, just go ahead and do that. Anyway, um, head on over to homebrewedchristianity.com. Remember to share this on Facebook and Twitter and all those things that you like doing. Leave us a comment. Give us some feedback. Um, but uh, most of all, most of all, just um, remember, I hope that uh, these, these little ingredients get in your earbuds and, and you become a theology nerd of a whole new level, a whole new extreme, that you overwhelm your imagination, theologically speaking, with things like J.C., not, no, no, not the Hebrew, my favorite Hebrew, not Cobb, not just Catherine, but Jack Caputo today. That's who's here. End of religion. Faith in the postmodern age. Villanova University. I hope you enjoy it. Yeah, come hang out with us. It's worth the norm. Free game. today and I was waiting to see how things went yesterday uh, to decide which one to use and I decided on the way home that neither of them <laughs> was any good. Um, so I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about myself and my family. <laughs> Um, so what I did this morning was get up very early and get the coffee pot going and come up with uh, another set of remarks that um, I think will fit into fit into what we were saying yesterday, fit into the discussion we had last night, and I think will we'll fit nicely with what, what Merrill uh, was just saying. And um, I think we'll give you a... I would say a somewhat different picture of um, Jacques Derrida. Uh, I, I would say that Maro's picture is a little narrow, and in some cases exegetically incorrect. Um, and um, 
make these so we can have a discussion about this. About Heidegger, I, it was more uh, complicated with Heidegger. Uh, I agree with with some of what Meryl's saying about Heidegger. And, but again, I think there's a, another more generous way to look at what Heidegger was, was doing. So, uh, but uh, I don't have, I, I don't, I, maybe that can come up in the discussion. So what I'm going to talk, talk about is, the title of the topic is The Deconstruction of Religion. Okay. So I'll get to the end of religion by talking about the deconstruction of religion. That is, I'm going to take uh, postmodernism to mean, um, I'm, I'm going to fill, postmodernism is a sort of cultural term, and it's a much wider term, and it means a lot of other things besides uh, deconstruction. Deconstruction is one version of, of postmodern theory, but postmodernism is a lot more than just postmodern theory, and it's a lot more than just this version. But this is the version of it that makes the most sense to me, and I also think of all of the all, all of the varieties of postmodern theory. This is the one that has the most bearing on uh, religion. It's the most it's the most interesting for religion. So let's start. Um, well, I'm going to start with the last question we had in the discussion last night, when the very last thing was, does what does postmodernism have to affirm? Um, so let's let's talk about that. Um, first of all, uh, deconstruction, postmodern theory generally, deconstruction in particular, begins with the presupposition that all of our beliefs and practices, all of our institutions and traditions. All of our arts and sciences are constructed. That is, they are forged, which is a great word, right? Because it means both simultaneously to shape something, but it also suggests it may be a little funny. It could be a forgery. It suggests a little fact, fact, fact and fiction. They are forged or formed, or as Foster would, would say, they're constituted by a play of forces. Well, I thought they were constituted by con pure consciousness, and all the post historians break with that, and what we call hermeneutics and hermeneutic phenomenology and deconstruction is, is all post historian It's not that they're forged by, by a kind of pure neo-Kantian consciousness, but they're forged by system, systems of traces and systems of forces. So they're, they, if there's a transcendent constitution, the transcendental subject is not a transcendental subject, it's a, an anonymous field of interrelated forces and plays of differences in which things get formed or forged or constituted. And what sorts of forces? Well, the, the most obvious one, and the one that uh, these people paid the most attention to when they first began to develop postmodern theory in the, in the 60s and the 70s was language. And so it had a relationship back to Saussure and the play of differences in Saussure. So when Saussure talked about the play of differences, he wasn't talking about screwing around, playing, shooting them up, you know, and watching. watching that was a basketball image, by the way. He's not talking about, about not being, kicking a ball around. He's talking about the, diff, the discernible play of difference between ring and king and sing. It's the difference or the space between the sound, the final. The, the phonic differences that constitute uh, the, the identity of the words. But uh, the play of differences is a lot more than just uh, linguistic. It's also uh, historical and social and political, hierarchical systems are a comparable play of differences. Um, it's embodied, so you have gender differences and um, uh, uh, all, all, of, all of the differences rooted in, in, in affectivity. It, it's all of these different kinds of what we call matrices or webs, which produce, let's say, I'm going to use this phrase frequently, relatively stable effects. effects of this play. So a meaning, for example, is a relatively stable effect of a play of linguistic differences, rules of grammar, rules of usage, 
age, uh, phonic differences, semantic differences, etc. It produces relatively stable events. And all of that, that whole thing that I just went through, is what Derrida meant by the neologism différence. Okay. All that spatial, uh, that spacing, okay. webbing, inter interneting, interwebbing. Okay. But whatever is constituted or constructed or formed in those systems, whatever is constructed by those systems is deconstructible. And just the way that Aristotle said, whatever comes to be can pass away. Whatever is constructed is, is intrinsically, inherently deconstructible. And if anything is undeconstructible, because it hasn't been constructed yet. So what does deconstructible mean? Well, if we're talking about relatively stable unities of meaning, it means destabilizability. Okay? Now there's two different ways, to, well, there's a lot of different ways we could describe the, uh, destabilizability. But let me just single out two. On the one hand, it means things are reformable or transformable. And then I'm using the language of form, and that's the language that Malibu uses, and that's why Jeff yesterday was talking about plasticity, the plasticity of form. And that's the language which is ultimately Aristotle's. Okay? You think in terms of the of the of transformations, of informations, of reinforming. So you get the language of Aristotle, of form and, and therefore of plasticity. And the other way to think about destabilizability is to think in terms of things being inventable, reinventable. Or preventable. Okay, now I'm using the language of event. And event is the more postmodern language of Heidegger and Derrida and uh, Deleuze and Badger. It's it's uh, uh, the it's more it's uh, the language is au courant in postmodern theory. Right? Debate, one debate between Malibu and, and Derrida is, is the relative priority of difference or eventive language and form. I would say, and Derrida, and Derrida would say, form is an effective difference. Form, difference is simply a tra an anonymous transcendental field in which certain effects are produced, one of which is form. I don't think form, I don't think difference is a function of form. I think form is a function of difference. Uh, plasticity is an effect of difference, I would say. So, but that's something that we can, and that also has, goes back to this, to the notion of God, and where the plasticity of God is process theology. That, that's the difference between God as it's an old argument that the metaphysical society of America, if it's, if it's still there, is it still there? If it is, there's a sea of gray heads <laughs> debating whether God is octus or oxio. Is God pure act, therefore eternal and changing, or is God activity? That's, I think that's what I think the plasticity of God, part of the argument about the plasticity of God would mean. All right. However, whether you think of it in terms of event or form, either way you do it, deconstruction and deconstructability doesn't have to do with simple destruction. Which doesn't mean the things that are deconstructible won't be destroyed or can't be destroyed. The expression creative destruction wouldn't be bad except that it's the definition of capitalism and I'm not sure I want to uh, use it. <laughs> So let's say it's not completely bad. So a construction is a relatively stable formation or a relatively stable unity. Listen to that. It's a relatively stable unity. Unity is not first. Unity is an effect. 
That's why Derrida will describe difference, the play of differences, as a non-originary origin or a non-unitary origin. At the beginning is not unity, like the Neoplatonism, but the play of differences which produces the sparks or the effects of these relatively stable unities of, of meaning or whatever. Any, not, not simply meaning, but a practice, an institution, uh, a work of art. That's why I'd rather, I like to say that in hermeneutics, things don't have, don't so much have a meaning, they have a history. If you want their meaning, you're freezing them. It's a freeze frame. It's like a frozen waterfall. You can, the meaning sort of gives it to you in a still, but that still belongs to a process. It belongs to uh, this unstable matrix which is generating these effects. So a deconstruction is a destabilization, for better or for worse. Because so sometimes you regret the things you destabilize and you wish you hadn't. It holds a promise. Destabilization holds a promise. But it could be a disaster. If you're waiting for the day of the Jubilee, it may be the worst day of your life. It may turn out to be a day you should have stayed in bed. This process of destabilization goes on whether we like it or not. Right? It's, it, it's, it's happening. It's, it's transpiring with, with or without our consent. Therefore, it's a process that's going on in the things themselves. It's, it's, the, it's the very movement of time itself. And that's why Derrida will refer to it as its auto-deconstruction. There's a, there's a deconstruction going on whether we like it or not. There's a, there's a, de, a destabilization process, a shift, a series of transformations, a series of reinventions going on all the time with or without our consent. But it is also something, it's not only that, it is also something in which we can involve ourselves. That in, in which we can participate. So we can try to prevent the event. We can pr try to uh, stop it. Or we can try to promote the event or let the event happen to open up aleatory series which expose the, the system to incoming and unforeseen effects. The attempt to try to prevent the event, and sometimes you should try to prevent events. There's no, I'm not saying you shouldn't. The, the, the attempt to try to prevent the event is, you could say, conservative. It's, it's reactive and reactionary and regressive, but sometimes it's just conservative. The attempt to promote the event is proactive, progressive. Now, the expression postmodernism, I said, I always like to say, postmodernism is a word that I use when I want to draw a crowd. It's, it's not the best technical word we could use. The more technical word, the, 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 the better word is post-structuralism. And that goes back to an argument about these systems that we're talking about and their destabilize, their, their, their shifts, their, the, the changes that take place in them. Um, it had to do with the debate about whether all the changes that go on in the system are rule governed or whether the systems are open. The post-structuralists, otherwise known as uh, the 68ers, Deleuze and Dota and all these guys that came to be, who stole the thunder from the Germans and shifted the philosophical scene from uh, Germany to uh, Paris. 
The 68ers said these systems are open-ended so that knowing the rules of the system is not an, that if you know the rules of the system and you know how to combine the elements of the system you can in principle predict everything every effect that the system will produce but post-structuralists said no 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 language doesn't work like that and these systems are open-ended capable of producing unforeseeable unprogrammable fantastically prescient word to use this was the 60s before pro computer programming was, uh, you, you know, the coin of the day, the currency of the day, they were arguing about programmability, writing codes. The structuralists were saying a deep code is written in either in our brain, if you were a materialist like Chomsky, or in consciousness, if you had a more idealist theory. Um, but either way, you got the same result. That there are deep, there's a deep grammar by which the production of language is guided, which produces effects that are in principle rule governed. Derrida and the post structuralists argued against that, and one of the best examples was a, a famous discussion that went on about metaphors. What's a metaphor? A metaphor is an attempt to break the rules of language ever so precisely. To, to push them to the point that they shock you. But if you push them too far, then they don't shock you. They're just, they just misfire. So metaphoricity, the metaphoricity of language and the history of language indicates that it's an open system capable of producing new effects. And what's the very hardest thing that people doing AI work right now have? It's producing unprogrammable effects. They need programs to produce unprogrammable effects. Don't underestimate them. They're working on it. Now, philosophy and theology are concerned with this question of the way in which we involve ourselves are drawn into um, allowing these uh, 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 novel effects to occur. Apart, on the one hand, on the one hand, changes will occur whether we like it or not. On the other hand, we we participate in that process. And. The task is always to find the optimal mix of conserving and pushing to the and pushing the envelope, conserving and promoting the event. Too much order, and the system dies. Too much disorder, and the system just simply volatilizes. It dissipates. It's, it's pure madness or chaos. You could, there is such a thing as too many events. So what you need is, to invoke a magnificent word of James Joyce, what you need is chaosmos. Not just cosmos, not just chaos, but chaosmos. That is to say, states are in a, that are in systems that are in a, mac, a state of optimal, optimal disequilibrium. Right? Too much equilibrium and it goes down. Now, so what we're interested in is the process of destabilization in which we ourselves can have a hand, in which we participate. And we want to know by what is that process, which, I'm, which we call reconstruction, ordered or commanded? To what is it loyal? To what does it swear in earth? earth? Or to take up Terence's excellent question last night, to what authority does it answer? What authority does it recognize? What call, to what call does it respond? What does it answer? 
answer. He says, oh, I gave a bunch of answers to this, but one of his best, one of the ones I like the most is the unconditional. The unconditional is what moves the deconstructive process in which we have a hand. Of course, as Marib was saying when he quoted that line from Derrida, language has already started with us. Right? It's not waiting for us to get into this process. And it will keep on shifting with or without creative poets and without Shakespeare's and without other geniuses. It's, it's running. It runs in the impersonal third person. It runs. The conditional is what has been constructed under the, under the conditions of language and history and socio-political structures and the system, the, or the systems I described. The, the conditional is what exists in space and time, what is actual, what is factual, what is real, what is historical. The unconditional, ah, there's the rub. What's that? It's what we're dreaming of, what we're praying for, what we desire, what we affirm, what we're loyal to, what we're commanded by, what we're responding to. And to borrow a Heideggerian formulation that Derrida is fond of, it's a, it's, a, it's a complex of callings. What is calling to us? What is being called for? What are we asked to recall? I'm, I mean, I have chapter and verse for this, and I, I, I've documented it at some length, but I am making salient and underlying a religious tonality. Right? That's what some deconstructionists abhor. They abhor vacuums and the prayers and tears of John Derrida. They do not want to hear this part of it. They say this is deconstruction is just a descriptive enterprise. Nonsense. It is all about having a vocation, a call, a provocation. Evocation. And these are, uh, I think, uh, structures with a religious tonality, a biblical tonality in particular, because this word religion we have learned to put into quotation marks, but a biblical one, mostly Jewish, but since we are all spiritually Jews and being Christian, it's, it's with us too. It's with Christians too. It's also very much like, or, or at least it fits together sort of neatly. When I was listening to Jeff last night invoking Tillich on the Protestant pr principle, it fits with the Protestant principle pretty nicely because it's saying <coughs> no finite relative condition, conditional conditioned construction is ever adequate to the unconditional, the undeconstructible. So the undeconstructible is a call that we can never adequately answer. It is a call which it is to which we are always already responding. It is not our doing. It's what's being done to us. It's like waking up with a start in the middle of the night. 
What was that? Was that a dream? It is not a projection. It's not Feuerbach. It's the opposite of Feuerbach. It's a projectile coming at me, which puts me in the accusative, in the on the receiving end, in the me voici. It's a projectile. It's not in my head. It's a projectile, projectile headed at my head. Now, think about constructions. And all the time now, remember, where does religion fit in all this? Because that's where I'm going. Think about constructions, which are relatively stable unities of meaning or of whatever they are. So relatively stable traditions, relatively stable institutions, relatively stable um, artists, uh, works of art or artistic movements. Think of them as exposed on two ends toward the future by the what by the call of what they are being called to. And Derrida calls that the promise. What is the promise that is getting itself promised in the middle voice? word like, say, democracy. What is getting itself promised by that word? And it's exposed on the other end to a primordial memory, which started also will call the structure of mourning. It is destabilized by a promise which it has not fulfilled by a memory that it cannot recall. It trembles between, under the, 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 that call and that recall, that promise and that memory. It is, there it will say, spooked by the Arrayon. They're like old Scrooge standing on his bed all a tremble by the smook or spirit of the Christmas to come and the spook of the spirit of Christmas past and the spook of the spirit who is who woken up from a sound sleep. And so there it says, this is uh, this is my uh, anthology. His ontology, not his ontology. Being, if Heidegger were capable of making a joke, <laughs> Heidegger would have said, "Being is spooked by time. Being is destabilized, for better or for worse, by time." Being is made, put it in a more Augustinian way, and you would say, being is made restless by time, and we are the restless hearts. In creatum est cornustum, we are the restless hearts. The way I like to put it is to, is to start. I like to say, the unconditional does not exist. It insists. It calls. And existence is what is called for. We are on the receiving end, in the accusative, me voici, of a call which is visited upon us, which we didn't ask for. we can respond, or, do, how did you put it, no, do, do our best manage not to notice it, <laughs> repress it, forget it, ignore it, just walk away. Well, 
that's the that the call is is the the, the unconditional is the call by which we are constituted as the beings that we are, by which we are souped or haunted or in more uh, uh, pious language inspired, or we can fall into the sickness unto death, into despair, which is to ignore our spirit, to ignore our daimon, to ignore the spook. We are called upon to fill up what is lacking in the body of the call, which makes of us in ontology beings of hope in the promise, beings of faith in something unforeseeable, which is not a mere belief, because belief has content and determination and, and a certain amount of fixity, whereas this kind of hope is a hope in something haunting and disturbing and destabilizing. Hope and faith and love something undeconstructible, unconditional. In theology, we call hope and faith and love the theological virtues. And we contrast them to the cardinal virtues, and as you know from the Latin, uh, that the word cardinal comes from the Latin cardo, meaning hinges. So we could say the card- if the cardinal virtues are the virtues of the hinged, then hope and faith and love are the virtues of the unhinged and the scooped, the destabilized. I would say the cardinal virtues are the virtues that we use by me, are the virtues by, with which we negotiate among the conditional. These other virtues, these the theological virtues, are the virtues by which we are exposed to the unconditional. Derrida will say, he doesn't put it in terms of the cardinal virtues, but the cardinal virtues are the virtues that deal with the possible. The theological ones with the impossible. Because these clusters of effects, these relatively stable horizons of, of uh, these relatively stable meanings, institutions, processes, uh, histories, traditions, form a horizon of possibility for us. We, we live and move and have our being within relatively stable horizons. But what interests deconstruction is the interruption of those relatively stable horizons. That is to say, what interests the construction is not what appears to be possible within the horizons of understanding that we accumulate and constitute, but what interrupts them, shatters them, makes them new in a way that we didn't see coming. The unconditional is infinite. Not because it is an infinite being or existent. The unconditional is not a finite being or an infinite being. It's not a being. It's not an existent. It does not exist. It calls. It is infinite in the sense of in infinitival. It is infinite in the, in the sense that it is unfinished. It is always, already, structurally unfinished. Always, already, to come. Infinitival. Grammatologically, the unconditional is an infinity. The unconditional X is always the X to come which haunts any present form of X. Whatever has come is 
actual, present, finite. And exposed to the solicitation of the to come. Literally solicitation from the Latin solicitare meaning to shake or tremble. The unconditional is the possible, the or the conditional is the possible and the horizon of possibility and the foreseeability. The unconditional is the infinite, infinitival, impossible. Of which we are expected to be the finite conjugations, the response. Yeah, the actualization. Well, like what? Like what's an example of the unconditional? Well, the most famous, well, this is the most famous, but one of the most famous, certainly the first most, and most, the, the first time they, Derrida talked about this in a way that was, uh, 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 Caught everybody's attention, let's say, was when uh, Jusil Cornell uh, at Cordoza Law School um, invited him to give a uh, talk to the law faculty at Cordoza on justice and deconstruction. And as he said, uh, this was, uh, he said, you are, uh, you are trying to intimidate me. Uh, you, you think uh, what can deconstruction have to say about justice? This is a challenge. <laughs> and he there made this, uh, gave this very lovely and also, I think, very, very hermeneutical interpretation of the distinction between justice and the law. And he said, and he's, he goes back, he's going back to a line from Pascal about the, uh, the force of law. And so he says, justice is what we desire, what we affirm, what we uh, love with uh, desire beyond desire. But uh, the law is what exists. So justice calls, justice is what we, what we, what we desire, what, uh, what's calling upon us. The law is what exists. And so we speak of the strong arm of the law or the force of law. The law is what's actual. It has real force. It's a construction. It's got an, an army or a police or an institution. And it may or may not be just. Whereas justice has not the wherewithal to lay down its head. Justice does not exist. Justice. We yearn for justice. We weep over justice. Justice. Overtakes us, surprises us, interrupts us, won't let us rest, won't ever let us say this is just. Except in momentarily. And so uh, Pascal says justice, justice is a weak force. It's a call. And Pascal says, since we cannot make justice strong, we must make what is strong just. So we must make the law just. So we must do that again and again and again and again because we're never going to do it. Right? And so whenever we make a law, it belongs to the demands of justice that we make the law repealable, recallable, reformable, reinventable, transformable. Whatever exists has to be plastic. It has to be transformable. It has to be reinventable. Otherwise, it'll be a monster. The law will be a monster. 
unless it is unless it is destabilizable, unless it is uh, porous to the demands of justice. And there I gave you other examples like that. I just uh, I do that one very quickly, but um, you give other examples like that, like hospitality. What is, hosp what is hospitality in its unconditional sense? It is welcoming the stranger. Well, it's a risky business. Welcome hmm? the, the stranger unconditionally. The knock on, the, on your door in the middle of the night, maybe a, a stranger in need of a cup of cold water, or it may be trouble. And we have to negotiate the distance between those two things. Right? You can't make a rule that always open the door to the coming of the other, because that's just another rule. Deconstruction is not about rules, it's about unprogrammability and how to, how to negotiate with the unprogrammable. The same thing is true of forgiveness. Unconditional forgiveness versus forgiveness under certain conditions. But if you forgive under enough conditions, it's not much forgiving. It's more like paying off a debt. The banks talk about forgiving your mortgage, but they only forgive your mortgage after you've paid it off. <laughs> they, 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 when banks come around giving, offering gifts, watch out! Banks don't give gifts! And they don't forgive, unless you already have met all the conditions of the debt. So Derrida did a series of very interesting, brilliant uh, analyses of negotiating the difference between the conditional and the unconditional. Because we live in the distance between the two, right? If we simply lived in actuality, in reality, we would be contracted into the present. But the fullness of our, the, or the uh, ambl ambience or amplitude of our existence is its exposure to the past and the future, and the absolute past and the future that's coming. So we're, we're constantly dealing with spooks. So what about religion? Where does religion uh, fit in this uh, situation? Well, religion is clearly on the side of a construction. As Merritt said, of course, you are. Religion is something we've done. Revelation is something God does. God needs qualification, I would say, but um, there's something to it. Religion is clearly on the side of a construction. What is religion? It's a, it's a relatively stable effect. It's a conditioned, conditional actuality. And in, in particular, as we've noticed in the last uh, 25 or 35 years of scholarship in the study of religion, it is a word of a loaded history. And it is deeply embedded in colonialism. It's a category we came up with in order to justify the distinction between Europeans who have the true religion and uh, indigenous people who are pagans who don't have the true religion and then the Pope issued a very famous encyclical right around the time of the discovery of the new world uh, declaring that non-baptized Christians have no right to land, to own land so go get them so the word religion is, is loaded with uh, colonial power also a modernist term, and it has to do with this putting religion in a box and separating it from the public order. So it's an enlightenment word. In the Middle Ages, it meant you took the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. You either did or you didn't. If you took the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, you were a religious priest, and if you were did not, you were a secular priest. If you, were a, you weren't a lay person, you were a secular priest. Uh, if you were ordained. So you could be a secular priest and you could be a secular layman or you could be a religious priest or you could be a... I guess a or, or, or you could be religious but not ordained. You function in a completely different way than did in modernity. What is religion? First and foremost, it's a, it's a, it's a constituted effect. 
It's a word that we use with much trepidation with respect to people outside the Western tradition. It doesn't. I was in the Middle East one time, and uh, they were tra- I had a translator, and every time I said religion, it, it, uh, it translated into Arabic. And I said, what's the word you're using? And he told me, and I said, what's it mean? He said, I don't know what it means. It means religion. And I said, well, yeah, but religion is a Latin word. What's it mean? Um, and it ended up, it meant something having to do with law. Anyway, granting all that, what does this relatively stable unity of meaning that we use in Christian Latin called religion, what does that, where does that fit into this, the schema? Um, Well, I'm saying this structure of the unconditional affects visits itself upon all, every sphere of uh, activity. It is found in art. There is an unconditional affirmation going on and, and a response and a, a uh, answering to a call that is going on in the work of art. It is going on in ethics and politics, and I think in politics, in science, since I say science doesn't think, it's not very thoughtful. Science thinks deeply and profoundly about the mystery which we ourselves are. Each of, which, each of those activities is a passion, a desire, an affirmation. And it is guided by a logic, I'm going to call it a logic, but I I prefer to call it a poetics, but for the time being I'm going to call it sector and I'll call it the logic of the unconditional, the logic of the undeconstructible, the logic of the impossible, which underlies all these things, including religion. So religion is one of these ways in which the affirmation of the undeconstructible, of the unconditional, is realized. It's one response. It's not like the unconditional is a universal essence. I mean, these are art, religion, science, etc. are species of it. The unconditional is a is a is a prompting to which we can respond in a variety of ways. One of which is religion. The logic of the unconditional, therefore, is a kind of proto-religion, because it's marked by this uh, hope and faith and love that I described earlier. The existence of a separate space for religion as a special form of cultural life is, the Stoic says, a sign of our alienation. Remarkable observation by Tully. It's a sign of our alienation. In the heavenly Jerusalem, there is no temple. We set it off as a separate activity. Why? Well, because religion is the Sabbath of life, Hegel says. We need a point where we stop uh, everything else and think. We need, a, we need a sacred space. We need to suspend the, the preoccupations of everyday existence for a moment to come back to ourselves who stand quorum dea. Quorum. I don't know what the Latin for unconditional. I particularly don't know what it is in the dative um, before the unconditional, before God. I make a distinction then between a proto-religion, which is the logic of the unconditional, and the existing religious traditions that we find in reality all around us, with this word religion. What what goes on in the non-Western world, this will be, uh, I'll just forget forget about that for the time. 
make a distinction between this proto-religion and the religious activities we find in the normal sense, the accepted sense of the, in normal usage. And making a distinction, therefore, between a radical theology and a confessional, historical theology. Theologies in the plural, really. Where the confessional theologies are sort of special, are local localizations of localizations and concentrations of a more elemental call, a more, more elemental event. So, in that sense, religion. I'm, I'm talking about one end of religion, and by drawing a border or limit between it and this other uh, logic of the unconditional, which I'm calling a proto-religion. This proto-religion is or should be everywhere. Where would you find it? You would find it anywhere, wherever there are human beings who have a concern for one another, for their world, and for their own and being of this proto religion would be found inside what we call religion in, in the strict sense or outside it with it or without it so that the distinction between theist and atheist is a, a secondary distinction it, it, has, it has force in other contexts but it is undermined by, literally mined under, dug under, by this logic of the unconditional, this proto or more radical religion. That's why it's possible for someone like uh, Jacques Derrida to write a book like Circonfession, Circonfession, where he inhabits St. Augustine's Confessions, and in which text he says he rightly passes for an atheist. Up, up there on the level of the confessional religions, he's an atheist. By the standards of the local rabbi, he's an atheist. But on this other level uh, of this proto-religion, the distinction doesn't obtain. The distinction is between the conditional and the unconditional, between answering the call and ignoring or repressing it. What does he do with uh, Augustine? This is, this is why Father Dabin was just beaming uh, in 2001 when we had this conference, this fire, about entitled Confessions in the plural, in which we asked Jacques to come here and talk about the St. Augustine and his book. I won't say his book on St. Augustine, but I would say his quasi-Augustinian, slightly atheistic repetition of Augustine. Augustine, he says, is always ahead of me, or I'm always trying to catch up to Augustine, to all the great philosophers. Does he launch what Merrill called an assault on the, cir on on, on the confessions? Anything. But what does he do? He tries to inhabit it, to repeat it, to reinvent it, to restage it, to replay it. Why? Because it's a compatriot of his. Literally, they're both from Algeria or ancient Numidia. They're both Algerians, North Africans, who made it big in the Big Apple in Rome or Milan or Paris. More importantly, on this level of what I'm calling proto-religion or radical theology, they are compatriots in responding to the call of the unconditional. And 
the key to understanding the book is to find a non-invidious way of comparing the difference between the two. Like saying one's an atheist and the other one's a theist, and one has a phony religion and the other has a true religion, and one is uh, producing a mime and the other one is the real thing. Invidious distinctions that miss the structure of the call, the logical, the logic of the unconditional. He tries to repeat it, reinvent it, restage it, replay it in a different context. The history, the things don't have a meaning, they have a history. The event is continuously being reinvented. The continuity of a tradition is the continuity of a series of recognizable responses to an underlying event. The history of Christianity is the history of a series of recognizable responses to the memory of Jesus and the promise of Jesus. And every tradition, all traditions work like that. Consequently, when you go through circumfession, you find corresponding structures of prayer and God and confession and faith. Faith in the unconditional, not belief in some confessional body of uh, assertions. And, and practices, but a, a underlying faith in the unconditioned. Prayer, can you pray to an unknown God? Can you pray without knowing whether there's anybody there to hear your prayer? I would say, that would not only can you, but that would be the best prayer of all. The prayer of someone who has... We begin a prayer by saying, Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, please be out there. Let there be somebody out there. Jean-Luc Chrétien says, uh, prayer is a wounded word. La parole blessée. Wounded word. What more wounded word than to know, not know, to whom you're praying and whether someone is there to hear it. We said to Derrida, which was this whole thing, the confession is structured like a prayer. It's not structured like an autobiography, it's structured literarily like a prayer. And we, every time I would get Derrida, Derrida in front of the crowd, I would say, to whom are you praying? And he was like, Rrr. he said, well, I would, if, I, if I knew that, uh, I, would, I would know everything. <laughs> a structure of confession. Confessing my circumcut condition. Circumfession, circumcision. There's a long, there's a story behind that word too. God. To which corresponds in circumfession the possibility of the impossible. The possibility of the impossible. One of our favorite names for God is to say, with God, all things are possible. When Mary says, uh-uh, this is impossible, the archangel says, with God, all things are possible. So the structure of the impossible is among our most elemental religious, perfect religious structures. Terms of time, I, I wasn't even paying attention. I should have. Yes, okay, I'll wrap it up. <laughs> the ends, uh, the plural. I suggested to Jake we put an S on N, but it was too late to go now. The ends of religion, I would say, uh, I would speak of the ends of religion in two senses. The first is um, the affirmation of the in, in, in unconditional seems to me. Or I'd make two points about it anyway. The, unconditional, the affirmation of the unconditional seems to me irreducible. That is to say that this notion of the, of the proto-religious. I cannot imagine what we would call human existence in any recognizable form without this. I don't know what it would be like. Uh, 
um, I would say that in, in, in the proto-religious has a future because it's, it is about, it is futurity itself. It's being futural. The end of that religion would be a disaster. Does that mean it won't happen? No. I think it's looming. Where? Among the programmers. The instructions are all about unprogrammability. The programmers. You know, this movie Transcendence, uploading consciousness into a, into a disc, you know, or like the, 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 what is it, in Battlestar Galactica, the Cle Cleons, is that what you're called? Cleons? What is, it? is that where they are? Silence. 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 The, they upload their consciousness into a computer and download it into a shiny new robot body. And then they have a resurrection ship nearby in case they run into a magnet or get blown up or something, and they have to download them all. They got, a, they got a backup copy, right? It's actually an extremely theological series, Battlestar Galactic, if, you, if you've ever watched it. Because these robots are the theists. The, the, the biological humans are, are polytheists at this point. It's very interesting. But what's, what's the, what you call transhumanism, the project of transhumanism or posthumanism is the project of the absolutely programmable. The absolutely programmable. At that point, you would have the end of the proto-religion, proto and that would be the end of the human. I would say. So there's one sense of it. Second sense of end is the end uh, of in the end of the sense in the sense of the limit of, of border of religion, and then that's in, in one sense I have to say well that's what I'm really interested in I'm interested in the limit between the confessional theological tradition the confessional religious practices beliefs practices and this treasure religion. And in the insistence of God, we describe them as a chiasmic intertwining. The, 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 this proto-religious impulse insists itself into and disturbs and provokes the confessional traditions. And while the confessional traditions give body and existence to the call, because the insist insistence does not exist, it, 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 it calls, it is our response which creates, which gives it body, which gives it existence. And so I would say, uh, in this sort of chiasmic interlacing of the one with the other, that the, the, the this proto-religion haunts confessional traditions. And because why? Because these confessional traditions are inhabited by, by deep structured events. By events which are their deep structure. And every once in a while they burn right through. And then that's when the confessional theologian loses his job. Because he said it. He's got two choices. He says it or he doesn't say it. Best thing to do is find yourself another job, then say it. <laughs> say it on the way out the door. So you say, By the way, <laughs> my idea is to keep, keep to keep them porous to, to one another. Because without the one, you the one, without the confessional traditions, what we're calling what this conversation would not occur. Right? But without this proto-religious structure, um, these these confessional traditions would calcify, rigidify. So I would close as is appropriate at the Catholic University with a prayer. With the prayer, what for me is the prayer of all prayer. The first, last, and constant prayer. Which proceeds from the sentiment that the end of religion is endless, open endedness. The endless, open endless endedness of the to come. Endless exposure. Which leads to a prayer which 
is the next to the last line at the end of the New Testament. Come, Lord Jesus. Come. Which in a proto-religious discourse would sound like bien, oui, oui. Come. Yes. Yes. Yes, I said. Yes. Come. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Here's how it's going to work. When you come back to the panel discussion, uh, the first half we're going to allow questions from you. Uh, and the second half, they're going to have sort of an extended free form conversation. And I think Meryl Palmy, the receding moderator, is the hope in that conversation that I will sort of fade. I'm going to name Jack. Vanishing media. Vanishing media. That's it. So I'm going to try to wrangle it as best I can non coercively. Uh, and I would ask that our panelists rec- re- recognize that the prayers you've used the last two days have had an amazing economy of words. And we will keep that in mind as we proceed. Take a break. See you in a few minutes. To start up here, we are going to get Jack two follow-up questions to his presentation since we didn't do that before the break. And once we do that, then we'll go to more general questions from you uh, for the panel and anyone you choose. So follow-up questions for Jack to start with. Anybody? Yes. Thank you for your presentation. It's great. Um, so, in 20th century, like particularly uh, Marxist, Marxist circles, you'll see this common distinction between uh, actually existing socialism and then like real socialism. So maybe it's probably because I'm too close to you. Um, there and then, of course, uh, Derrida was famous for talking about democracy in sort of similar terms, where you're talking about the undeconstructable. Um, um, elemental uh, democracy. And so my question is, is there also an elemental or an undeconstructable fascism? Uh, because uh, democracy, socialism, for a, you know, a pinko commie academic like me, those are all very comfortable. But I'm wondering about um, th- this question of fascism as a way of opening up the question, uh, are there events um, or undeconstructables, which can be um, evil or problematic or violent or something like that, or is it, or does violence um, and oppression and these problems always stem from an inability to recognize the events, or can they be the correct response to a bad event? If that, if that distinction makes sense. Well, I already I had one. <clears throat> Word answer for you, but you kept on talking. <laughs> and that is when you said, could there be a, a deconstructable national socialism to come, an evil to come? Yes. So this, there's, in an uh, interview with uh, Elizabeth Lunesco, one of the uh, sections is entitled, The National Socialism to Come. That is to say, we can dream of evil as well as dream of justice. And uh, so sometimes when we're dreaming of justice, we produce evil. And when we dream of the, the, the name of God can be a, the name in which we uh, murder. And so, yes, the, the event is a, is a promise slash risk. And uh, it may produce the worst evils. Because you, when you, that's why I said at one point, when you destabilize, you destabilize, for better or for worse. You may, you may make things much worse. I mean, I think for him, by the way, just one quick, quick, quick I think for him, the very, the very form of evil for him uh, at one point is the program, the utterly, totally, completely programmable. I guess this is kind of a, a two-part question I was thinking up earlier. Um, uh, I'm kind of new to postmodern philosophy in, in general, uh, and it just hasn't been my background. And uh, one of the questions that has come up during this presentation is, is uh, what's the role of the ideal um, 
in postmodernism, postmodernism um, because you know there are accusations that either relativism and and uh, um, and if you can uh, mm, with the language. So uh, so for uh, I know a lot of Husserl, um, and for Husserl, what caught him and what maybe was a motivator behind philosophy as a rigorous science um, was was his background in mathematics, uh, the, that, you know, um, two plus two equals four, regardless of the, the symbols and language for all cultures. Um, a triangle can be grasped uh, by anyone. Uh, and I think he saw potential in other types of inquiry for that kind of, uh, um, uh, for that kind of, uh, 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 Essence grasping. Um, I'm not sure exactly the term, especially the German. And um, and let's see. Wesenanschauung. Yes. Okay. That's it. Um, uh, and and I think he would say uh, that we could do something similar with other types of inquiry, just that it would be much more difficult, much more complicated. Um, and uh, so that's kind of the first part, and the second part would be related to this, and it has more to do with religion, I guess. Um, uh, confessional theology, this distinction between radical theology and confessional theology. What's the role of confessions then, and dogma, and doctrine in religion? Um, uh, many might see this as a sort of uh, as a sort of ideal. Um, uh, I don't. I don't know. If, yeah. There's a solid okay. Uh, there is. We these are just deeply interested in Husserl and in the constitution of ideal objects. Uh, but what we want to do is get the very first technical work that Derrida did as a student of philosophy was on the problem of the constitution of ideal objects. Exactly that. And he uh, emphasized, there's just two sides of Husserl in that one, and people keep getting confused. It's like people rushing from one side of the boat to the other when they went with Husserl, the early Husserl. On the one hand, he, he looked like a, a psychologistic, like he, he made mathematics a function of accounting. On the other hand, he looked like an idealist and a Platonist. So the, the first, in the the first volume of logical investigations, he looked like a, a, a psychologist. In the second volume, he looked like Platonism. So they kept running to the other side of the boat. And what he was trying to do was balance the act of constitution with the uh, objectivity of the, the ideality of the ideal object. What Derrida does is show in a sort of systematic radical way that uh, ideal objects are themselves always uh, constituted. And um, their ideality is, uh, is ifish. That is, if you ever started counting, you would get this result. But it doesn't mean that they have some kind of ideality. And then he also showed how deeply dependent the constitution of ideal objects is upon space and time and repetition and writing. So in the history of geometry, this purely empirical thing called writing actually is the clue to the constitution of geometric objects. Uh, in the second case, the confessional, you wouldn't want to think, he, he wouldn't think, I don't know that anybody wants to think about the confessional uh, traditions as ideal objects or idealities. For, for him, they're responses. They're, uh, they're, they're ways of giving uh, flesh and blood and space and time and existential presence to the address of the unconditional. So the, the call insists that confessional theologies exist, and then my idea is to keep them in constant, make them porous to each other. Well, I will follow up that, uh, uh, and then meet the other panels, and then maybe they want to. Uh, what, so do you think uh, confessions have a role? I mean, it, it, it's Sure. If we didn't have a confession, we wouldn't be talking about anything here. <laughs> okay. We wouldn't have any memory of Jesus or anything else. So, anything that we call now today religious? Yeah, why don't we address that? Uh, I think one of the things I said last night is relevant here. Um, uh, communities um, of any sort, and religious communities in particular, um, need to have a collective sense of who they are and of their identity. And one of the ways they do this is through shared practices. 
and the other way is through shared beliefs. Um, and those those two are intertwined. They aren't independent of each other. Um, and so from a sociological point of view, it seems to me that uh, if there is going to be a religious community, it's going to have to have a confession of some sort. And uh, those, those forms of Protestantism that uh, proudly announce that they are non-confessional um, mean that there isn't a place where you could go online and find out the official creed of the Southern Baptist Church. But if you go to a Southern Baptist Church, you'll find that there are certain beliefs that they hold and that are very important to them, that are their creed. Uh, they haven't written them up as a creed. They don't recite it as a creed. Um, but they do recite the, the phrases uh, often uh, and again. I'm not picking on the Southern Baptists. They're by no means the only non-confessional uh, church that proudly announces their non-confessionality. Um, but um, uh, there's, a, there's a sense in which... Um, Confession, in that sense, is inescapable as a sociological fact. Um, as a theological fact, um, the, the question is: um, Is this a good confession? Is it legitimate? What What is its warrant? Um, have Have we said the things we ought to say? And do we think about what we say? The things we ought to think about what we say. The, the meta discourse. Uh, which is where I think uh, postmodernism is particularly uh, relevant. I, I will pick on Southern Baptists because I was one for a long time. Um, and it's true. I mean, they, the Baptists take great pride in, in, in not really having a denominational structure and not being a confessional community. But they do have a, what's called the Baptist faith and message, which is a codification of its beliefs. And the, the great irony is that the Baptists are um, today are the one the, the the most strident with regard to insisting that sort of those uh, people up for ordination, those people teaching at their seminaries and even at their colleges and universities, subscribe to this code of beliefs. And so, that for me, this is where I have spoken about a non-dogmatic theology. To me, it's where the, the Protestant principles really at work. I mean, that, that's where the kind of tradition becomes calcified. And one has to, one has to sort of be in a position to kind of introduce some kind of movement within that, uh, the, the, those kind of moments in which the, the, the kind of open flux of the tradition uh, gets fixed. It's the balance Jack was referring to earlier. You have too much movement, too much flux, the whole thing disintegrates. Um, and you get too rigid and too calcified and it dies uh, that way. And, and keeping some sense of balance between being open and being closed um, is, is uh, not at all an easy task uh, for any religious community and its uh, official thinkers, the theologians, uh, and so forth. But uh, I think the, the nature of the task is fairly clear. And it's important, just one quick caveat is that, and this may be a thing Jeff can um, help me think about. So classically, the dogmatist was as opposed to the skeptic. And so it was a matter of do you stand somewhere or do you reserve judgment about where to stand? And so there's ways of cashing out academic skepticism in particular where it's not a denial of the external world, say, like modern skepticism might be, but it's simply a refusal to finally stand because the reasons cut both for and against any true proposition. So it's not a denial of truth. It's just saying we can't affirm truth because the arguments cut both ways. So I genuinely sometimes wonder when we talk about like a non-dogmatic confession, um, I wonder if that means that it's simply a non-confessional confession. Like the, the, I'm not sure what it would look like to say, well, it's non-dogmatic, other than to say, well, it's revisable, it's fallible. And so in that sense, I think dogma is being run as a claim about a kind of um, infallible modern conception of a universal truth claim that all rational people would have to ascribe to. Right? I mean, does, does that sound right? So when you mean non-dogmatic, you mean that second sense, not the first sense. I mean, invoking the language Jack was using earlier, maybe by non-dogmatic, which what I mean, I think, is a kind of conditioned dogmatism, mm -hmm. or a recognition that sort of dogma is conditioned and 
conditional. And so therefore deconstructive one and Karl Barth, so the great dogmatic theologian, talks about the fact that you know this massive undertaking that he that he undertakes with writing the church dogmatics, that has to be sort of renewed and done again with every new generation, right? I mean this isn't the final word with regard to church dogmatics. So that to me that's that's the task of a non dogmatic theology, recognizing its conditional status. Questions? Yes. Um, is is there a, if if we view religion as a constructed form from deconstruction, um, is there a sense that um, religion actually functions as a way to obscure the call, so that religion can work in a symbiotic relationship? with the culture in which it finds itself so that each can survive and actually functions to cover up the call rather than bring it forth. Sure. Yes. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> what they said. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, that's, that's, it's, it's always a risk. You've got to... Every, every response is... Uh, so what, I mean, what, there has to be a, is there anything we can do? I mean, just, you know, I'm frustrated. <laughs> Pray for profits. <laughs> P-R-O-F-I-T-S? No. <laughs> misremember this uh, a little bit, but I, 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 I get the gist of it. And, and there's Jack and, and Richard Carney have had an exchange in which they, they're talking about that kind of uncertainty. And whenever you're, whenever you're opening yourself up to the event of truth, you don't know if it's going to be a positive or a negative event in advance. There's always a degree of undecidability at work. Um, and, and the you'll you'll know this story better than I, but it's it's you don't know sort of uh, when you're sort of welcoming sort of the, the new birth. You don't know if it's sort of married with the baby Jesus or if it's the alien movie with the alien popping out of the stomach. Right? <laughs> but can you tell that better than I can? <laughs> Maybe a little more graphic. <laughs> and, and the difference between you and Richard Carney, as I understand it, is you want to say no. You don't. You cannot know in advance. Um, there's a degree of undecidability that goes all the way down. Uh, whereas he wants to suggest it. Yeah, uh, that's how I understand hermeneutics itself. I mean, he's he's being he went, he's being very Habermasian, I think, at that point, because I think he wants criteria for knowing what to do in, in an ambiguous situation, whereas the definition of an ambiguous situation is that the criteria are ambiguous. And even if you have criteria, some criteria are more important than others. You don't know what applies at this point, and it may be that this is a case where uh, it's unanticipated by the criteria. So what do you need at that point is, well, Aristotle says you need experience, and you need uh, judgment. You need the ability, and what's judgment? You need news. And that's the ability to see into an idiosyncratic situation which you've not faced before um, and have a sense of what to do, and you may be wrong. Um, and it's uh, and when you're right, we call that insight and, and brilliance. Um, Richard and I have reached sort of an agreement on that, and we both say, well, what you, what you need is discernment. Discernment. Uh, I think discernment is discernment when the criteria have failed you. You see, virtually the same argument being worked out in the debate about scientific criteria when Kuhn first hit the streets, if he hit the streets at all, um, in the debate about paradigm switches. What do you do in a paradigm switch when the criteria themselves are uh, in question? So in, in situations like that, you need people with experience and goodwill and judgment. I've 
argued elsewhere that maybe a name for those people is something like a postmodern, you know, ethical political exemplar. And so I actually draw on Aristotle um, to say, and Edith Visegrad, who has this idea of a postmodern saint, uh, which is someone who spends her entire life devoted, you know, to the other. The problem is that often to be devoted to the other, you have to also figure out where devotion to yourself lies and your community lies. And so it requires these decisions. Um, but I think, uh, and, and maybe Jack, you'll disagree with me on this, I actually think we do need criteria. It's just that I think the criteria probably aren't going to be specified as necessary and sufficient conditions from some sort of universal rational perspective. They're going to be offered from within the communities in which we find ourselves, always hermeneutically invested, but there's still got to be some history of those judgments that tend to yield the kinds of things that we hope for as a society. And so I, I guess I'm I, I'm not sure that I think the undecidability goes all the way down or if I think that um, we deconstructive folk are here to make sure that the undecidability doesn't stop too soon and because it's got to stop at some point in order for the decision to occur at least relative to the standards by which the decision is possible for us as existing historical people and so at that spot, I, I think I do um, find, you know, Carney's line, I can't remember which book it is, um, Jack, the Zumblesick and Rue, or, or Keith Putt, I can't remember, but he has this line where he says, you know, eventually Korah, or a confessional god, it makes a difference toward which you move, and, and we can't sit on fences forever, and I, I think that's exactly right, but I don't think Richard would be wanting to say... Cora doesn't, you know, infect the way that we make decisions. The, the decision isn't done. The decision is always undone by asking, well, was it the best decision? Did, what, what could we do better next time? Who got excluded when I was trying to include them? It seems to me that that's where the undecidability happens is, it's, is in the real practices of deliberative critique that we do with each other on the backside of the decisions we made as a result of the criteria we have operative in our spaces. Uh, excuse me, so I, I, I was thinking of uh, the yesterday and today about uh, kind of different routes for postmodernity that, that weren't taken, and one, one of the, my favorite big friends I do think is Gary Marcel. So when he, when he starts to do his kind of move beyond the learning, he starts with the, the mystery of the body. Um, and what ends up happening. <laughs> I don't think many uh, thinkers take up this kind of mystery of the body question. And so postmodern thought and uh, deconstruction and hermeneutics become very language text focused. Um, so, in what way, with like, the end of religion and post, uh, postmodern thought in general, how do we speak of embodiment and, it, you know, carnal being, uh, something which Shakarni himself is writing about now a lot? Um, where, where is the body in, this, in these reflections? One way to, uh, did you want to go off that track? Um, I, I think the privileging of language uh, is not accidental. Um, I think, um, to begin with at least, um, the body belongs to nature and language belongs to spirit. And um, the realm of meaning has roots in the body to some degree, <clears throat> but the most fundamental meanings, uh, it seems to me, that, that govern human life and, and its values um, are the ones that do not stop <laughs> where the body and its desires stop, but which supervene <clears throat> on those. And uh, insofar as um, those are linguistically mediated, uh, and, and culture is a linguistic phenomenon, a language game, if you like, um, it seems to me philosophically appropriate that there be a privileging of language in relationship to the body. Um, but it, it should never get to the place where one treats the body as if it were a corpse, um, as if uh, human life as an organic phenomenon didn't have a certain level of meaning of its own. 
um, but a meaning which, as a matter of inescapable <clears throat> fact, is always caught up in the culture um, in, in which it happens and gets diversified in that way. I think I was supposed to shut up. <laughs> you said language. You're, you're the spirit. The body's you. betraying you, Meryl. <laughs> I, I would just, um, I don't want to put another plug in for Malibu, but plasticity is an embodied concept. Um, and, and, and as she describes the, I guess, the paradigm shifts that she sees happening right now and which she's instrumental in achieving as we, we, we shift from the epoch of writing and language to one sort of plasticity, materiality, embodiment. Um, so I mean, this, this notion of sort of plasticity emerges out of uh, the, the way in which the neuroscientists talk about the brain um, and dissolving this, this dualism between the brain and the mind. Um, and the body and the spirit. And doesn't that become a metaphor for uh, changes in uh, the body politic and uh, culture and, and mm -hmm. other things which are not uh, immediately material in the way in which the brain is? Yeah, but it is. I mean, at that point, she's, I mean, this becomes metaphoric or allegoric. Um, but as she's moved beyond this sort of initial. Um, kind of work in which she's she's trying to draw out the political and social implications of uh, uh, the brain's plasticity. Um, she's I think she's been sort of much more careful in in talking about uh, or sort of remaining within a kind of embodied framework, um, especially with the more recent work on psychoanalysis and Freud um, and in sort of gender relations. So. Um, so yeah, at first it was merely a sort of metaphor, but I think it's become sort of more and more material through and through. Feminist theory and queer theory also brought postmodern discourse back in, reminded of its body, and that, that was important. As, as deconstruct, Jean-Luc Nancy uh, has been a really important voice in uh, today, these days, in the last 10 or 15 years, and, and he's all about feeling and affectivity. Act act theory is is an, is an important point. Very one of the last things there ever wrote was the animal that therefore I am um, trying to. Uh, I think that the interest in language at the beginning was uh, situational. You know, structuralism was dominant. It went back to Saussure and said that the argument broke out about language. But it soon became clear that it was about a much more, much broader uh, uh, webs and, and interrelationships and uh, deeply uh, historical situated bodily context. So they didn't, they didn't start with it. And even Heidegger tried to abstract from it. In being in time, so there was that transcendental. There was Thoreau and Heidegger that had a kind of transcendental, uh, struck a transcendental attitude that s stayed there for a while until uh, Merleau Ponty. Really, I mean, Marcel was uh, absolutely on, on the money, but he nobody paid attention to him, uh, and that's because he didn't go through Husserl. I, I think in order to be heard in the 20th century, you had to go through Husserl, and he didn't. If he had said all those things in, in Husserlian language, he would have been a bigger player. As Malapunk, he did. As Malapunk did, yeah. And it's important also to say, I think, Jeff, you're hitting on this, referencing feminism and queer theory. Um, we, we, we then recognize that deconstruction, of course, deeply is tied to questions of justice, you know, ethical uh, obligation. Merrill talked about the counterintentional gaze, etc. Um, I think that here, then, the simple question, well, whose body? Right? If we talk about embodiment, traditionally, you know, this has been a very white male 
you know, heterosexual sort of upper class body, right? And I, and I think here then, you know, we're going on in different discourses that may or may not be tied to deconstruction, but I would certainly say in the big tent and postmodern way is certainly going to be a postmodern contribution. You know, disability studies, right, even Feta et cetera, are doing work, I think it's really helpful there. Um, in religion, there's a lot of work going on now about sort of race and embodiments relative to the practices of religiosity. So people like Monica Miller has a great book on religion and hip hop that just came out. She's got a new thing she's working on about black gods, these new black gods, and like what it means when Kanye says you know, he's a god, and rethinking the embodiment of religious discourse. My sister actually came around to Simmons down at the University of Alabama doing similar stuff at the intersection of race and gender. Um, and then the last place where, again, may or may not be deconstructive, but I certainly think it's postmodern, um, cognitive linguistics is a different approach to the kind of neuroscientific intersection that Jeff's referring to. Um, I think certainly less psychoanalytic, um, but for me that's okay since I'm not deeply compelled by psychoanalysis, but the cognitive linguistics of like Eve Sweetser, um, George Lakoff, and even right now, um, the open theist John Sanders has a new book he's just finished on cognitive metaphor theory, conceptual metaphor, as it relates to evangelical theological discourse, which will be fascinating to recognize why, like, even those faith statements for the Southern Baptist seminaries, who, by the way, as I understand it, tweaked things to make sure we open theists couldn't teach there, um, but <laughs> figured out a way to ignore, or as Merrill put it, sort of, you know, not notice the very rootedness of their theological discourse in the bodies that we possess, right? And so that seems also, I think, just a few different places where embodiment language, I think, is happening. I want to interrupt for one second, because you guys have been mentioning name after name after name, and I have this in my list of things to ask you. Uh, and in Malibu, for example, many of us, I think, is probably that name is probably new to us. So I'd like you, at the end, I want you to be thinking about it. the easiest question you get all day. Who's writing well now that we should be reading? Uh, and that's going to be the last thing we finish with. And so, for some of you, I know are taking notes. And so, just give us, I'm sorry, everybody I think by now wants to read Malibu. So, let's start, be thinking about that list. I also want something for introductory stuff to Kierkegaard, uh, Heidegger. Uh, and, I, and I say introductory like it's really a thing. I know. Uh, but, you know, just some place for some of us to start because, again, we're coming from different directions and haven't read all this stuff. So, that'll be the last thing we do. For now, I'm going to ask a question that came through on Twitter last night. That I'm going to let y'all go, and just, you're going to have your conversation. Feel free to redirect questions at yourselves. Uh, you've done a fantastic job so far of showing sort of hospitable disagreement, <laughs> so I'm sure that will continue as well. Would be less hospitable. No, I've learned to trust you. Uh, so what the question that came to you last night was, and Merrill kind of answered his sort of version of it already was, is there a difference, and if so, what is the difference between the God of the philosophers and the God of Scripture? And I appreciate. I appreciate Merrill's qualification earlier by saying we're talking about Christianity. So we are, in a sense, talking about Christianity, although it's not itself being a Hebrew text. We're going to make some reference there, too. So that's going to be the entry point. And if we need another sort of uh, a tweak, I'm going to, I'll come back in. But for the most part, I'm like, they want to hear you talk. I want to hear you talk. So start where you like. God of the philosophers, is there a difference? And if so, what with the God of scriptures? They're already deferring to each other. This is great. I, I think one of the merits of postmodern theory is to try to um, break the grip of the classical God, God of the philosophers and uh, get a better sense of the, uh, the, 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 the biblical God and to talk in terms of text and scriptural text so that you get. Um, Important secular philosophers who are really interested in St. Paul right? and who, who talk about Paul and Paul's writings and you know, read the Greek and, and, and come up with novel and, and sort of startling interpretations of Paul or Augustine. Um, so the merit, it seems to me, of postmodern theory. Uh, of the of the cluster of postmodern theories is precisely I think here's a sense in which the word onto theology uh, would be useful. The God of the philosopher is the God of onto theology. It's a God of uh, of causality, of cause and effect, of proving the existence of a, of, an, of a being um, and demonstrating its properties. And postmodern theory 
And that's you know, that's not the, you know, that goes back to scholastic philosophy. It was a tradition I was I was I was uh, nurtured in, uh, and it uh, continued in, uh, in through modernity, and it continues today in in analytic philosophy and in analytic uh, and in Thomism, in, in uh, particularly analytic Thomism. Thomism has become more and more analytic. I think that the kind of philosophers are. Through the, under through and under the, the, the phenomenological impulse uh, supplied by Husserl and sort of uh, institutionalized for us by Heidegger, and the existential impulse of Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, shifted changed the, changed the subject and uh, began speaking of God uh, of, of a biblically recognizable God. And so one of the things I was arguing in the prayers and tears of Jeff Derrida was that most of the discussion about Derrida and, and religion up to that point had been about Derrida and negative theology. And I said, Look, it's not there. this is not negative theology. I mean, there are interesting sort of resonances in negative theology, but it's not negative theology for one reason. Negative theology is Christian. It's, the people that they were talking about were pseudo Dionysius and the Christian Neoplatonic tradition. I said, He's not interested in that. He's Jewish. This is a very Jewish picture emerging uh, in deconstruction. It's a, it, it's a, it's a, you know, the question is, is the psychoanalysis a Jewish science? I, I said, well, you know, is deconstruction is a, a, a Jewish, not science, but some discourse. Um, and Derrida was, I think Derrida was hearkening back to a, um, uh, a, a, a biblical voice that he grew up with as a kid. He was just, you know, he just absorbed it by osmosis. Then he met Levinas, and Levinas gave it philosophical uh, language. And then it was Levinas, perhaps more than anybody in this whole gang, who introduced the voice of the Bible into contemporary philosophy in the most exotic, strange, weird language. What? Yeah. He, he put it into no known lang human language. I mean, Zephyrus is so, such an exotic writer. But if you, if you come from the, the uh, if you have a biblical tradition behind you, you hear it. You hear it, you get it, because he's talking about the King Yenai. The, that, that's the way you pronounce the, the, the Hebrew. Uh, the mivasi of uh, and this uh, inverted intentionality, uh, which is a biblical phenomenon, stuff that philosophers never thought of. You know, philosophers thought in terms of heteronomy and rationality. But the postmodern uh, discourse about religion, I think, took a decisively biblical turn away from the God, uh, classical God of the philosophers, which was pretty much the God of Monte theology. I was part of a, a colloquium some time ago that became a little book, uh, which was formed around the thesis, philosophers of religion in the APA tend to be fairly classical theists, and philosophers of religion in the AAR tend not to be. That was put forth as a fact that nobody would dispute. <laughs> and the question that was posed is, how do you explain this? And we didn't do a very good job of explaining it. We tried, but we, everyone agreed that it was a fact. Um, and uh, so the, if you ask, well, who's the god of the philosophers? Um, one of the answers you have to give is, well, which philosophers are you talking about? Um, and the, the philosophers of religion in the APA, who tend for the most part to be Christian, uh, for one thing, and fairly classical theists in the context, um, almost always have at least some fairly deep affinity for Aquinas, which means two things. Um, one, they, they don't shy away from the abstract and personal metaphysical discussions that are rightly identified as ontotheology. And so they'll, they'll debate about the simplicity of God and, and about the various omnis and, um, and so on and so forth. Um, but at the same time, like Aquinas, um, they're Hegelians. 
Um, and that discourse is Alf Gehoven, their Kierkegaardians. That discourse is teleologically suspended um, in a biblical discourse in which God is the God I tried to identify earlier, uh, a God who is a, a purposive agent and not merely a cause, uh, and a speaker who enters into covenant and who uh, gives commands and who offers promises and so forth. So that abstract metaphysical and the biblical personal, the I, thou kind of uh, business um, are perceived um, uh, together. Um, and uh, insofar as that's the God of the philosophers, um, that's the biblical God subjected to certain kinds of philosophical reflection without disappearing. Um, uh, there are other ways, it seems to me, of, of putting God to philosophical uh, subjection in which uh, the person of God, the personal, the, the thouness of God, um, a God who could see me and a God who could address me does evaporate uh, and disappear. And then, as in those passages from Derrida that I was quoting uh, earlier, God becomes a name for something uh, quite different and uh, usually uh, something very human. I'll be brief. I, 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 what I love about Jack's work is that I, I think the weakness of God is the recovery of a, uh, of a distinctly biblical conception of God. Um, and, and to the extent that it's scandalous amongst, um, I guess, traditional religious communities or Christian communities, I find that um, I sometimes despair over that. The idea that, that you can't sort of recognize the, this discrepancy between the ways by which certain non-biblical conceptions of God have been kind of overlaid um, onto the biblical conception of God that I think Jack's work really does nicely recover uh, and, and, and makes it a stumbling block once again um, as it originally was. So one of the one of the things that I teach my students a lot is, you know, when Nietzsche kills God, it's the moral God. He says who's died, it's the God of philosophers. We read Batimo and he says, you know, that the death of the God of the philosophers allows for the possibility of the God of the book to signify again. So all, we, we get a lot of mileage out of this distinction. So um, since the fellow panelists have, I think, explained how they make sense of that in, I think, really profound ways. <clears throat> Let me maybe at least give one reason why I sometimes worry about the distinction, um, even though I would, in 90% of other contexts, defend the distinction. Here's why I worry about it. Um, and this was, in some sense, part of what I was trying to get to last night in my talk, but... <clears throat> So about uh, about two weeks ago, my son woke up at one o'clock in the morning and um, went to the restroom and then proceeded to pass out at like you know one at one fifteen a.m. And my wife and I happened to be in there because he had yelled, you know, "Mommy!" So we were running in. I'm grabbing my son's body, which it turns out phenomenologically, that sort of insider experience. I've never held a dead body, but I can't imagine it feels much different than holding a body that has lost consciousness, right? I mean, just the sheer, there is no muscle resistance that I experience is terrifying, right? For, for anybody, especially when it's your five year old. And so without even thinking, there was no reflection, there was no decision in either a Viridian or a you know, speech act theory sense. It was simply, I found myself screaming, Jesus help my son. I cried out to the god of philosophy. Right? I wasn't thinking cause a sui, help my son. <laughs> um, I think I was crying out to the god of the scriptures, the, the god that for me is present when I take communion in my churches, You know, the god who is present um, in the worship services when I'm playing drums and it's not just a matter of getting the eighth notes right. right? Whatever that is, that's I think the god I cried out to. <clears throat> Here's my worry. <laughs> I often wonder when I go to philosophy religion conferences, and I try really hard, um, and maybe as the conversation goes on, I'll try to defend this a little bit more strongly. <clears throat> I try really hard to um, say that the analytic continental divisions in philosophy of religion 
in particular um, are not things we need to even mess with overcoming anymore. It's just stuff we should ignore um, and start drawing on whatever resources seem helpful for the questions we ask. And so that's why I call it mashup philosophy of religion, right? We should just mash up, draw on whatever makes sense, do the best work we can in answering questions. Um, that said, when I'm at these conferences, I rarely think to myself, the God about whom we are talking, mainly as Christian philosophers, right, which I mentioned last night, is a problem in all sorts of ways and something we need to also find ways to overcome. But I'm pretty sure the God about whom we speak as philosophers is rarely the God to whom I cried out when my son was limp in my arms. That seems like a disaster somehow. <laughs> and yet, it seems like if it's, if it's something we bring more closely together, that we've got two worries. We have the ontotheological worry that now the God about whom we speak in philosophy is the God of scriptures, which means we've got philosophical categories overlaid on theological discourse, and so we're never actually now speaking about the God of scriptures, we're only ever speaking about the constructed discourse that's operative in philosophical communities. Oops. Right? That's one worry. So onto theology. The other worry, though, is the worry I have about analytic theology. If any of you are familiar with this movement in, in recent years. And my worry there is that philosophy of religion really does just become theology. And again, my reason for worrying about that is because I have too much respect for theologians. I, I think there's a different kind, as Merrill, I thought, did a great job of saying earlier, there's a different kind of immediacy to the evidential sets, right? The ecclesial, revelational, biblical, whatever it is, authorities can operate in theological discourse in, with an immediacy that they just can't in philosophy, and I think shouldn't. So I'm, I'm, I, I'm an officer in the uh, Society of Christian Philosophers, and yet I've uh, very publicly stated I think Christian philosophy is bad strategy for philosophy of religion right now. Precisely because Christian philosophy has itself become the power discourse in philosophy of religion. So we don't any longer need to, in some sense, speak from our Christian starting points. Because when we do this, what we're usually saying is, let's ignore the starting points of all those non-Christians, right? And so it becomes the very sort of problematic discourse that all of us on the panel want to resist. So I don't know what to do, right? So it's all that to say, it seems like somehow the philosopher, I've got to speak about the God that I speak to, I think, when I cry out when my son's laying in my arms. And yet, if I do that... I think I may necessarily engage in either onto theology or just theology in a way that makes philosophy no longer something that matters. So I don't know what to do relative to that, but that's where I find myself right now wrestling with what is the future of philosophy of religion. I don't, I don't know. Uh, let me add another thing. Uh, I think I said that I think that Levinas was a really important uh, source for turning kind of philosophy in the direction of uh, its biblical beginnings. But I think that uh, that's, that's uh, we need to add to that. First of all, Kierkegaard himself. I mean, Kierkegaard uh, thought of himself uh, as a religious author. And uh, he has his, he has his Climacus said that he's not trying to create a new philosophical system. Uh, but he revolutionized uh, the direction of philosophy. I think every, everybody who came on the scene in, in 20th century kind of philosophy had come under the impact of Kierkegaard, whose thinking was, was uh, deeply uh, biblical. And then, even in someone like Heidegger, this is why it's interesting when Heidegger, Myro points to these texts where Heidegger talked about correcting theology, uh, which he certainly did. Um, he was correcting it in terms of the uh, of being in time, but being in time was uh, pretty much the ontologization of Augustine's Confessions. He tells us there's a he gave a course on Saint Augustine's Confessions that uh, was published about uh, 20 years ago, and we translated it into English and published it in well, published it in his Indiana series. Translated by one of your students. Yes, two of my students, Matthias and Jennifer. Um, another course on Saint Augustine. It was a two semester course. The other course was on Saint Paul. What Heidegger has to say about time 
which deeply influenced what Derrida really said at that time, which you are hearing today, comes from a gloss that Heidegger made on First Thessalonians about not knowing the day nor the hour and not trying to count it up with calendar time, but being inwardly transformed and ready. The, the structure, of, and Heidegger took that very scriptural New Testament sense of temporality and rewrote Husserl's lectures on time consciousness and turned them into an ontology so that you would go to a very secular meeting of colonial philosophers or take the strike secular. You just go to the, the meeting of colonial philosophers, the, the Society for Phenomenology of Science Philosophy. Yeah, people going around talking about uh, the temporality of human existence in a way that is at bottom, Pauline, and the holy other, which is at bottom Levinas and very Jewish, and not knowing, you know, not knowing the Paul or the or, or the, the Hebrew scriptures that, that were that are behind it. So, I think that experiential biblical sense uh, and, and scriptural understanding of God was uh, foundational. I, I once wrote a little piece on the history of that, and every single one of those people had a degree in theology. Who, the five people who founded the phenomenology group, the philosophy group, all had degrees in theology. And some of them, some of them had renounced it, <laughs> or, and denounced it, Charlie. but they all uh, had started, started in theology. Well, this might be obvious. What I'm about to say, I think the, um, the the distinction between the God of the philosophers and the God of the Bible, however we're putting it, is, is certainly fundamental to uh, a lot of postmodern philosophy of religion and the ways by which people have tried to address the problem of ontotheology or to redress the problem of ontotheology. But that's not to say that somehow the, the biblical conception of God or the biblical portrayal of God is unconditional. Um, I mean, that, that too is a condition um, construction that can be deconstructed as well. Um, so, I, I mean, just because one is able to kind of make that distinction uh, doesn't sort of get you out of the fix that I think we've been trying to describe over the last couple of days when it comes to speaking of God. So I have a question in for Jeff and Jack. Um, Merrill and I both, I think, at least hinted, and Merrill, you can correct me if I misunderstood you on this, at least hinted toward the idea that the difference in philosophy and theology, though absolutely constructed, there is no, you know, sui generis distinction in play. These are histories, you know, so in this case, Jack, I agree with you, it's not a meaning claim, it's a history claim. But one of the histories, and a very prominent one, that differentiates philosophy and theology is as a matter of the kind of evidential authorities operative in the two different discursive communities. One has something like capital R revelation, something like ecclesial you know, authorities that operate. <clears throat> one has something like this thing called reason that then shows up with all the sub K's and H's and S's. And yet, um, <clears throat> I, I, if, if something like that history is right, I guess I wonder why radical theology counts as theology if Jeff was right last night to say it has no relation to an ecclesial or revelational or biblical authority structure, that it's independent of this. Why not call this something like... Um, <clears throat> You know, I'm thinking here of like its relationship to what sometimes is called, you know, critical theories of religion. You know, it seems to me that there's an awful lot going on in the sort of meta critique, especially Jeff in your paper, that sounds a lot to me like a just a, a very substantive and important. Um, supplement to people like Russ McCutcheon and Craig Martin and um, Jonathan Z. Smith, who I know you made some reference to. So why not, in some sense, identify with that tradition and radicalize it, rather than identifying with a tradition historically defined by authority appeals that are now being rejected, which would seem to reject the tradition? 
I tell you all really quickly, that's going to be, you get the last redirect, and you, you can answer that. But we're going to have, we're over time, so this is going to be the last sort of thing to address. So. Well, I mean, I do think something is critical theory of religion, but I'm not interested in that so much as I am interested in uh, what, it, what the American Academy of Religion calls constructive theology. Mm -hmm. That's what I. That's what I do. Now, in a in a simpler day, we would call that philosophical theology. I would rather call it. Um, I I I prefer the expression not theology but theopoetics. So I think it's a what 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 I'm doing is a is a phenomenology of. Uh, our experience of what's going on in the name of God. Uh, I also, and this is what I like about Hegel, I deny any strict distinction between reason and revelation. And uh, I think our revelation, what, what we're calling revelation, is a response to the unconditional that addresses us, which takes the form of religious narratives and, and, and metaphors and metonymies and uh, parables and uh, its own kind of special uh, discursive resources and, and practices. Right. Um, whereas, um, uh, you know, for, for philosophy is a, is, is a different sort of thing. I mean, I, but I, I don't think, I, I, see, I think the, the under, underlying, method, the underlying method is, is, is some kind of phenomenology. Uh, religious discourse is giving word and practice to an address. That is not a matter of a, of a divine revelation that came into us and from above, and we could have never gotten it by the un unaided reason. It's not. It's different from rational discourse. Not because it's supernatural, but because it's a it's a poetics. It's a poetics of the experience of the unconditional. That is not a matter of propositions. Okay, so. We could literally go forever here. I, I know, and some of you actually want us to go forever here. Uh, but we have to actually clear out the place at some point. So, briefly, um, recommendations for them to read, uh, especially Malibu and uh, Aaron. You mentioned a couple of names earlier, and then uh, Merrill and Jack. Whatever you think, just, just down the line, recommendations to read. Papers, books, doesn't even matter. Just whatever you think they should be reading in a contemporary context for this discussion. They should be reading us. <laughs> well, so my, my, well, so my recommendations are actually going to sound a lot like that. Um, I, I would say if you want an um, introduction to what postmodern hermeneutics is pretty much all about, I highly recommend Merrill's book, um, Hughes Community, which rationality, I think it's fantastic and, and does a great job, again, of locating this in the context of theological discourse. If you want to see a, um excellent account of how a kind of Derridian notion, not only of maybe what God could mean, but also what justice could mean as applied in, in some practical way. I think um, Jack's book, um, What Would Jesus Deconstruct, still stands as a very good example of, of what that can be. Um, as a, a little bit of a step back, from the specific context, um, a book that Bruce Benson and I recently wrote, came out last year, um, I actually think is, is I hope, um, a good place to go if you want an introduction to basically the tradition of French phenomenology to which we're all appealing in various ways. Um, sometimes it's referred to as you know the theological turn in French phenomenology. Um, specifically, people like Derrida, Levinas, Henri, Chrétien, Marion. Um, it, Bruce Bitts and I wrote this book simply called The New Phenomenology of Philosophical Introduction. It's geared toward basically graduate students um, or professional analytic philosophers. That's the audience. It's, it's people who don't know this material but are interested in it, and we try to present it in a way that is um, written as much as possible in a kind of analytic, propositionally sort of way, which I'm sure makes um, Jack itch. But we did it that way precisely because we were trying to, in this case, not bridge two different discursive communities, but bridge the kind of commitments that people like us hold to the kinds of strategies that other people them operate by. So I'd say those three. Yeah. I'm terribly disappointed that I didn't get to answer Aaron's question. But this gives me the occasion to um, sort of put a plug in for an unpublished book that, on radical theology that I, I hope will be coming out in the not too distant future. In which I. Where? I hope. 
appropriate with Meryl Streep. <laughs> in the end. We're working on it. So, I mean, in that, I try to, I try to make the claim that there, radical theology is a discernible tradition of thought with its own lineage. Um, and, and I think that's, it, it's not an, an argument that, or really a case that's been made, and I, and I try to make it there. So, be on the lookout for that. Um, for Malibu, I would, I would say uh, that the starting point for most people is her book, What Should We Do With Our Brains? And that um, and there she kind of articulates a, a real kind of radical philosophy of, of freedom based on uh, a material sense of embodiment uh, that I think is really intriguing and, and, and suggests some interesting sociopolitical implications to that. Um, if you're interested at all in the kind of connection I'm trying to make between uh, Malibu's work and plasticity and liberation theology, I think the book to look to is Changing Difference, in which she uh, interrogates uh, kind of prevailing thought within gender theory and feminist thought and really kind of takes on both Derrida and Butler uh, in that book. Uh, I think it's, it's really, it's very accessible. There's a chapter in there uh, where she kind of situates herself specifically in reference to uh, Kant, Hegel, and, and Derrida uh, and, and puts those differences in critical relief. Um, I want to begin with a plug from my own latest book, uh, Kierkegaard's Concept of Faith. Um, but um, Jack has mentioned the importance of Husserl uh, as background for all of these discussions and has mentioned Derrida's uh, writing about Husserl. Um, <clears throat> Levinas has an important uh, book on Husserl, one of his, well, in, in a sense, he introduced Husserl uh, to the French. Um, and um, uh, I'm surprised that it only moments ago Marion's name was mentioned for the first time and we've gotten this far without mentioning him but he's certainly a major uh, figure in the discussion that we are having and he has a book in which he uh, takes off from Husserl and and tells us how we need to revise Husserl in order to do what needs to be done. It's called Reduction and Givenness. It's not the most interesting book of Marion's, but it's certainly fundamental and important. And um, any of his writings, but especially the uh, essay on the saturated phenomenon, which is now located in I don't know how many different places uh, it's appeared, um, that would be um, something that would be... Uh, uh, very important uh, to look at. He's he's an author that deserves more of a place in this discussion than we have given him this weekend. Mm -hmm. Jack, um, the most the, the most uh, the clearest expression I've ever been able to give to all this stuff from my own stuff, my own work is what would Jesus deconstruct. And that, that, that book sort of keeps on keeping on. You know, it's being used in intro courses and stuff. So you know, that, that, that if you actually want to hear the, 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 the specifically Derridian version of this thing we're calling medical theology, that in the plainest language that I have, that, that's, that's that. If you want a, a, a more popular uh, voice who is... Don't underestimate him and think that he's just screwing around. Uh, I read Pete Rollins. Peter Rollins. Peter is trained and he puts things in a sort of conversational way that makes you, I first think he's not to be taken too seriously. Take him seriously. He, he puts things clearly that are aimed specifically at people who can't spend their whole life trying to figure out what difference means. <laughs> um, if you want a more uh, sophisticated, uh, academically oriented survey of what's going on in contemporary uh, philosophy of religion, uh, what's Karina Geschwanter's book, which says modern goes apologetics. through everybody? The, the book on postmodern apologetics? Postmodern apologetics, yeah. Came out with, uh, that, that, that's, an, that's for an academic audience, uh, and it's, it's a more technical account, but it's a comprehensive, amazing a survey of, of the field, and she has going for her that she is trying to build the shoes of <laughs> the, the thing that's lost to my life. 
And if you also want a, a very much more technical but very focused debate that is the sort of stuff that maybe Merrill and I sort of in various ways are representing and Jeff and Jack are in various ways representing as sort of at least two different options within deconstructive philosophy of religion, um, Stephen Minister and I put together a book called Reexamining Deconstruction and Determinant Religion. And in that, um, Jack has a uh, very, I, I think it's actually the best Jack, um, summary of your thought that I've ever read in a technical way, and he cashes out different versions of postmodernism. Merrill has an essay in there where he's also responding, sort of, you know, defending what we call religion with religion. Um, so that also, I think, is a very technical but very focused attempt to do the kind of conversations we've been having here um, in a little bit more, I think, feisty uh, way. <laughs> Just in case you don't know, the best introduction to Derrida's thought is Jack's book, uh, The Prayers and Tears of Jacques Derrida. So, and Jacques Derrida would probably tell you that if he were here. Yeah, thanks. All right, so Carrie's going to close us out. Thank you so much for everything. <laughs>